The United Kingdom has some of the most intense caves around the world, and they had been frequented by avid explorers for over a hundred years. Swildon's Hole is one of these caves. Although entered by many adventurers today, some of the earliest trips to map the caverns were huge operations by experienced cavers, but this did not mean the dangers within could be conquered. The men that entered the cave on a cold January morning would soon realize this reality. This is their story. Hello everyone, and welcome to my channel where we cover all tragic and terror stories. So if you enjoy this type of content, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button, plus ring the notification bell to be notified of all new uploads. And, as always, viewer discretion is advised. Dry caving carries a significant risk for explorers that choose it as their hobby, but can provide an unbelievable reward of exhilaration in sights that very few in the world will ever get to see. Some caves are large passages that are more or less harmless and seen by many as it is easy to get in and out, while other caves are inherently riskier and more difficult because of tight passages. These are called restrictions that require wiggling your body in between the rocks with some spaces being small enough where your only option would be to inch forward on your stomach with little ability to move your limbs. Those that suffer from claustrophobia or anyone who frightens easily from feeling trapped should not partake in this particular adventure. Caving has a strong history in the UK going back over a hundred years. There have been avid spelunkers wiggling their way through tight passages with nothing but basic supplies, helmets, and lights. It was always seen as a brave yet dangerous hobby, especially to those wanting to enter an unmapped cave. Swildon's Hole was first discovered in 1901, and today we know it as the 9,144 meter cavern, but at the time it was a small hole in the ground with running water pouring into the entrance. The upper part of the cave has many restrictions and changing landscapes that make for an incredible journey, but cold water flows through the cave starting from the entrance. Those that come unprepared can be heard throughout the caverns as their teeth chatter. Bringing the correct gear is a must. 35 years after the first discovery, explorers map the upper parts of the cave until they reach Sump 1. A sump is a passage of a cave that is completely filled with water. And to pass through it, one would need to dive into the water and swim to the open passage on the other side. It could be a very short dive that many free divers could take on, or an incredibly deep dive that would need additional equipment. Deeper or longer sumps should only be tackled by those that are familiar with cave diving, as it is very different from exploring a dry cave. The first sump in Swildon's Hole was successfully dived in 1936, where they found additional caverns on the other side, and from then on, cavers tried exploring and mapping the new areas. What made Swildon's Hole exhilarating for some is the amount of sumps throughout the caverns, each with their own challenges. The first few could be free dived, although not recommended. This is when a caver would swim through the muddy water with no canisters of air relying solely on how long they could hold their breath. The larger sumps cannot be traversed through free diving as it takes several minutes of swimming through filthy water to reach the new passages. Since it is a cave, the water is dark and muddy, making it impossible to see a few feet in front of your face. The only guide being a thick rope that is tied in between each sump so the cavers can pull themselves through the restrictions. Imagine dragging your body underwater through a small passage, mud entering your face, your nose and eyes as you had a death grip on a rope held in front of you. You don't know where you're going and your lungs are burning, but you pull and eventually feel the stagnant air of a new passage, free from the water at least until you reach the next sump. On January 17, 1959, a large group of experienced divers and medical personnel walked through the woods, snow crunched under their boots with every step, their breasts creating a cloud of warm air surrounding their faces as they carried pounds of gear. 
Although not specified, the operation was estimated to be around 30 to 40 people. They arrived at Swilden's Hole in the early hours of the morning with the intent to reach Sump 6 and continue exploring to find more passages that had yet to be mapped. For the caving hobbyists, this was an extremely popular cave because of the size and notoriety, so it was not uncommon for many groups of cavers, some experienced and others not, to be in the cave at the same time. The team of explorers that arrived on the morning of January 17th were split up in a few groups of three to four cavers, while supporting groups would follow only to enter the upper levels of the cave to help provide supplies to the more experienced divers. In 1959, the equipment was not nearly as technical and safe as today's adventurers, so as the groups of men started entering the cave, other bystanders and cavers saw the scale of the operation and were generally curious. One of these men was named John Wallington. John was an explorer in his own right, but was not an experienced caver. Still, he was interested in the caves and wanted to help the team on the cold morning. So he stopped one of the groups, wearing nothing but a long sleeve cotton shirt and jeans, and pleaded if he could tag along. The group was cautious at first, but eventually allowed him to go into the cave, as normally the caves would be challenging, but not impossible for less experienced cavers. So one by one, they slowly squeezed their way through the small entrance that lies in the middle of the wooded countryside, a stream of water hitting their backs, their breasts stolen from their bodies as a shiver ran down their spines. They began making their way down the first passage, soaked but determined. Their lights bobbed up and down the cavern as they climbed. They traversed through the start of the cave with no problems as they were simple restrictions that many individuals could squeeze through. They traveled down a sharp incline, then their lights would fade into a black void. They stood over a 40-foot waterfall, which is the first real test for the inexperienced cavers. John looked over the drop, holding onto the rock next to him. His light, attached to his helmet, shined into the abyss below him. He saw the lights of others already on the ground below and could not contain his own excitement. This was incredible. The climbers would descend using a rope tied to the rocks above the cliff and a ladder that reached the bottom. The ladder was a rope ladder, which meant it moved with the pressure of the water. Climbers would have to take on the brunt of the waterfall as they climbed down through its icy wrath. They hear nothing but the intense sound of running water. No words needed to be said as a mistake here is a death sentence. John watched as each member of the group made their way into the water and down the ladder. They moved with such ease, even with the packs of gear on their backs. He felt out of place, yet was determined to help. Further in the cave with a different team was a group of experienced divers, Oliver Wells and Phil Davis, who were taking the charge to reach the sixth sump and began exploring for new passages. They had already been in the cave for over a few hours, but had noticed changes as they moved through the sumps. Nothing concerning, but the water level was increasing slowly, making their progression difficult. Yet everything was going great, at least from their perspective, as they reached sump 4. They began prepping their gear in the small dark cave for a longer dive. Their headlights reflected off of each other's grinning faces as they slowly finished their work. They did not need many words, both knew why they were there, and slowly they entered back into the freezing water to make an attempt to go through the sump. After a couple of seconds being underwater, Oliver turned around, and surfaced quickly telling Phil the sump was in bad condition and they should not proceed. Both were a little bummed, but being experienced cavers in the 1950s, this was not uncommon, and Phil trusted Oliver completely. So they grabbed their small supplies of chocolate bars, water, and extra lights, and turned around, defeated. As they made their way back through the four sumps, the water level was much higher, and both looked at each other with worry in their eyes. They knew what this meant. Outside of the cave stood the remaining support members, and they had been in a rush, panicking for a few minutes as the cold weather had turned for the worse. It was raining, 
and not a light drizzle, but a downpour. The stream of water at the entrance to the cave had intensified, leaving only a small exit point for the mini cavers still trapped below. In today's world, this would be easily avoidable, as you would not be looking to explore a cave if there was a chance for rain. But in the 1950s, there was not the same warnings, so many of the experienced cavers were trained for these scenarios. They had one goal, get out, now. It was just above freezing temperatures, so the snow was being washed away in the water, creating blistering cold currents in the cave. The water levels became more intense as the snow melted. As Oliver and Phil made it back to the 40-foot drop, there was a line of cavers and support people making their way up the ladder. It was a bottleneck of people, since only one person could climb up the drop at a time. And to make matters worse, the waterfall had intensified tenfold, meaning each person had to climb up the ladder for 40 feet against the current. Even though it is not a huge climb, the waiting cavers in the bottom would lose sight of each person because of the water pouring over them. Nobody should have to face these conditions, yet it was the only way out. As they were the divers and some of the most experienced cavers of the entire operation, Phil and Oliver were at the back of the line, and they noticed a man curled into a ball in a corner wearing nothing but jeans and a cotton shirt. A deadly mistake in these temperatures, as the correct caving attire is a must to stay warm under the earth. He was shaking uncontrollably. His teeth were chattering but making no sounds, as their eardrums only heard the rushing water. Phil and Oliver immediately jumped into action. One thing was for certain, whoever he was, he needed help. They gave him a piece of chocolate, which he slowly took and ate, and they lifted him up to the front of the line. He needed to be rescued as quickly as possible, so they pushed him up the ladder into the freezing water since that was their only option. John began to climb. The group at the bottom was still a congregation of 10 to 12 people, and they watched as John slowly made his way up the ladder, but they soon lost sight of him through the waterfall. John climbed on, finding the next rung, yet his grip was slipping by the minute. He could not see through the downpour, yet he continued pushing. Suddenly his foot slipped as the ladder moved under him. He grasped his fists in the air, but only grabbed the falling droplets. Then he felt the pressure on his head as he hung upside down, struggling to breathe. It was similar to being waterboarded in a torture chamber, yet there was nobody that could stop it. For those below, 10 seconds passed then 20, then 30. There was still no sight of John. All that could be heard was the overwhelming sound of rushing water mixed in with the occasional word for those waiting for a sign. A couple minutes go by with John hanging upside down and the group realized something must be wrong, yet they could do little to help. Michael Palmer and Mike Whedon were a part of the group at the top of the waterfall, or 40-foot drop, and they were called in to help with the rescue after the rain had started. They were the most familiar with Swilden's Hole, and knew that this would be the most dangerous section. They too noticed that something was wrong, and began pulling the ladder up themselves through the pouring water. They stood in the stream, their feet firmly placed, with their backs taking the brunt of the force of the water their faces in sheer agony as they pulled as hard as they could. Soon enough, they saw a man come over the edge. He was shaking uncontrollably and could not speak. In 1959, there was not the same equipment and procedures that go into rescues today. They were trained to administer simple first aid, but their main objective was to get John out of the cave. So after they pulled him over the drop, their instincts were to check him, then start to climb up the inclined passage through another pouring stream of water. But they could not do it right away, as John's limbs were locked and he was in bad shape. They pulled him over to the side, where there was a small dry area, and began rubbing their arms all over his body to try and warm him up. John lay there helpless. He no longer had a helmet, a light, or even shoes. His arms were held in front of his face, his fists 
ironed closed as if he was still gripping the ladder, unable to move. Michael and Mike fed him chocolate bars as they tried to warm him up, and some of it was starting to work. They were able to lower his arms, but he was still shaking violently. They had no other choice. They had to get him out, and get him out now. So they put him back into the pouring water and began moving up the passage. As soon as John's body felt the freezing water wash over him, he screamed. He screamed at the top of his lungs over and over. He wanted nothing more than the water to just stop, but his body could not do anything yet scream. The sound pierced Michael and Mike's ears over the rushing water. They quickly pulled him back out of the water and continued warming him up. As they sat in the one dry area working on John, more cavers were coming up the ladder and exiting the cave. There were only a few people left to make the climb, and they slowly passed the group of three one by one. Michael and Mike watched in horror as there was nothing they could do. All sounds around Michael went silent. There was no running water. There was no rescue team or other cavers making their way by them. It was just them three, sitting in utter silence, listening to the shaky breathing coming from John. Time slowed down, what felt like minutes went by, and Michael watched John's face as he heard a deep inhale, then an exhale, and there was no other breath. There was a silence even as they watched in dismay as the final members made their way up the ladder and began walking out the cave. It was their turn. They looked at each other, knowing what they had to do, their faces carved into a look of despair. This was no longer a rescue mission, but a body recovery. They wrapped John in a large cloth and began carrying him up the remaining passages. Their arms burned through the cold, their heavy breaths labored, but their thoughts racing as they could not help but feel sorry for John. There was no more screams, as every step was a struggle. The freezing water poured over them. Nobody had stayed to help the two, so they struggled alone in the dark carrying the load of a body. No words needed to be said. Finally. Michael and Mike felt a ray of sunshine. As they climbed through the water, they felt hope that this nightmare would soon be over. They were the final members to climb up and out against the gallons of water pouring in. Everyone had made it, except for one. John passed away because of hypothermia and was believed to have fallen behind the group he was with since he was not as experienced and they were focused on their job to bring supplies to others. Because of this accident, there were significant changes made in the caving community regarding procedures and equipment. Equipment would be developed to help cavers in severe cases of hypothermia. All cave members of organized groups were required to let other members know whenever and wherever they were to explore. Although loosely practiced before, many groups adopted this as a principle as it meant all members could be accounted for. Today, this is widely accepted and encouraged for those not in a group, but simply see caving as an extreme hobby. John's death is a reminder of the many dangers that lie in caving, whether it's hypothermia, becoming lost, drowning, or rocks collapsing. All caves should be respected, as when you enter, there is no guarantee that you will exit.